Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome students from Coulter Elementary School of the Houston Independent School District, a member of the Confucius Institute Network. 女士们、先生们，晚上好！让我们掌声有请来自孔子学院网络休斯顿独立学区的 Coulter 小学的同学们。Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2017 National Chinese Language Conference. Please welcome the superintendent of the Houston Independent School District, Richard Carranza. 女士们、先生们，晚上好！欢迎大家来到2017年全美中文大会。让我们掌声有请来自休斯顿独立学区的主管 Richard Carranza 先生。
So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the most diverse city in the United States of America, Houston, Texas. On behalf of our Board of Education and the 216,000 students and 30,000 employees that are the Houston Independent School District, I welcome you here this afternoon to this conference. My name is Richard Carranza. I serve as the Superintendent of Schools here in the Houston Independent School District. And I want, to, I want to congratulate you on celebrating a milestone of 10 years for this conference. How about a round of applause for yourselves? <clears throat> as a student who started in the public schools of America speaking another language other than English, I have firsthand knowledge of why it is so important for students not to be monolingual, but to be bilingual, and if possible, trilingual. So what it is our goal in the Houston Independent School District that every student that graduates from our school district will be multilingual, at least bilingual, and a, bi and a biliteracy seal on their diploma, proving that fact. In the HISD, the Houston Independent School District, we want every one of our students to be globally competitive. That's why with the help of this diverse city's employers, our industry, our college, our parents, we have developed a global graduate profile which we consider to be our North Star. It is what we endeavor to do each and every day. We know that students, in order to be competitive in the 21st century, must be leaders. They must be adaptable and productive and productive members of society. They must be college ready, they must be critical thinkers, they must be skilled communicators, and they must be responsible decision makers. Those are the components of our global graduate profile. And we know that language plays an important part in that profile. Now, I know that some of you have had the opportunity to visit some of our schools here in our school district, and we are very, very proud of our schools. If you did visit our schools, you saw passionate ed educators dedicated to producing multicultural, multilingual graduates. You saw the benefits of our dual language programs that are ubiquitous across our city. You saw students in dual language programs consistently performing at very high levels. In fact, we know that students in dual language programs consistently perform at high academic levels. And due to the vision of our former superintendent, Dr. Terry Greer, and our former board member who is here in the audience, Mr. Harvin Moore. Mr. Moore, are you here? Stand up, please. There he is. Due to their vision, the Houston Independent School District established the Mandarin Immersion Magnet School, which we consider to be the crown jewel in our Chinese language studies here in HISD. You see, it opened in the fall of 2012 at a time when Mandarin Chinese was the most spoken language in the world. The school is growing every year, adding a grade each fall until it becomes, it will become a pre-K-8 campus by the year 2018. This past summer, the school moved into a brand new $32.2 million state-of-the-art building. You see, the Houston community and the Houston voters and taxpayers have endorsed our language programs, and this $32.2 million state-of-the-art building is testament to that. It's 119,000 square feet designed around a sun and moon concept, brightly colored learning spaces that are located in the sun wing, which represent energy. Community spaces such as a cafeteria and gymnasium are in the moon wing, which represents reflection. The building's library is housed in a soaring three-story atrium. In 2018, it is expected to be the largest Chinese language emergence school in the United States of America. And for every eight applications that apply for the school, there is one spot. So the demand is heavy here in Houston. Some of you may have also visited Coulter Elementary School, a language magnet school where students can study Spanish, French, Chinese, Coulter is also part of our Passport Global Schools Network. Some of you visited Sharpstown International School, a middle high school combination developed in partnership 
with the Asia Society International Studies Schools Network. And with more than 90 languages spoken, the school prepares students for active roles as global citizens and develops them with a knowledge of world culture. Some of you may have also visited our Houston Academy for International Studies, also part of the Asia Society's International Studies Schools Network, where students are prepared to be 21st century global citizens. And finally, some of you may have visited the innovative programs at school at St. George Place, Lanier Middle School, and Bel Air and Fur High Schools. You see, we're very proud of the global experiences that our students are experiencing here in Houston. And again, as the most diverse city in the United States of America, we know that our students that are learning other languages and experiencing cultures are learning Chinese, not just for doing business in China, but learning as a part of being a global graduate, knowing the history, the art, the music, the food, and the cultures of other cultures. So on behalf of everyone in the Houston Independent School District, I say to you, welcome to Houston. Enjoy your time in Houston. And because you help fund our schools, buy lots of souvenirs. <laughs> Have a great conference. Welcome to the great state of Texas and Houston. Thank you. Please welcome the Vice President of International for the College Board, Linda Liu. 掌声有请美国大学理事会国际部副主席Linda Thank you, Superintendent Carranza, for all of those remarks and for welcoming us to Houston and into your schools. I had an opportunity this morning to visit one of your schools and was just so impressed with the commitment of your teachers and the love of learning that all of your students displayed. So wonderful work here in, in Houston. And I am just so proud that uh, the College Board has this long-standing relationship with the Houston Independent School District to uh, provide opportunities for students in the district. Good evening, everyone. My name is Linda Liu, and I'm, I am Vice President of International for the College Board. On behalf of the College Board, I'd like to welcome all of you to the 10th Annual National Chinese Language Conference. I would like to start by sharing a personal story with you. And uh, for those of you for which this story sounds familiar, I ask you to please not judge me. Um, I have two young daughters who are both studying Mandarin right now. And last year, my older daughter uh, started learning Chinese characters and having to take tests in her Mandarin class. And after her first test, the results were, shall we say, less than ideal. As a uh, very, uh, very caring mother, I went to talk to her teacher immediately. Um, I passionately expressed my concerns to her teacher, and her teacher listened to me. She looked at me, and then she sighed. And the only thing running through my mind at that point was, I totally should have asked my husband to do this. But then she said to me, So basically what she said to me was, calm down. <laughs> Learning Chinese is a long journey. And I subsequently learned that this was like the 10th time she was telling a parent this. So that made me feel a little bit better. But it reminded me that wanting to learn a language is easy. But becoming proficient in a language now that is what takes patience and commitment and practice. As we reflect during this year's conference on the tremendous growth of Chinese language learning that has occurred over the last decade, I marvel at how far the field has come and how remarkable the achievements have been because it's not that only interest has grown, but that the proficiency, the level of proficiency in Chinese language and culture and a depth of understanding for both the language and the culture has also grown with it. And while the field itself is much older than 10 years, there is no doubt there has been significant growth in learning Chinese in the last decade. 
from students in districts across the country taking their first steps in their journey of discovering the rich culture and traditions of China, to administrators and learners traveling to China to gain deeper perspective on Chinese education and society, we've seen a heightened enthusiasm for learning Chinese. So let me just reflect on how far we've come in the last 10 years in the field of Chinese language and learning. 2007 marked the launch of the College Board's AP Chinese Language and Culture course in response to a passionate call from all of our members to increase the teaching of Chinese language and culture in US schools and communities. We had also deepened our partnership with our friends at Hanban, who had provided great support for the AP Chinese Language and Culture course. Additionally, our partnership also focused on building support and resources for the teaching of Chinese in K-12 districts across the country by bringing cohorts of Chinese guest teachers to the US bringing U.S. administrators to China, establishing district-level Confucius Institutes and classrooms, and collaboratively offering the annual National Chinese Language Conference with our friends and partners at Asia Society. So how far have we come in 10 years? First, we have seen U.S.-China educational relations continue to blossom as both countries deeply commit to supporting the work of the U.S.-China High-Level Consultation of People-to-People -People Exchange, or CPE. This important work is committed to building bridges between our two countries and to deepening the communication, exchange, and collaborative work of our societies. The first National Chinese Language Conference in 2007 was attended by 700 leaders and educators. Today, we have over 1,200 leaders and educators here with us, something that we're extremely proud of. Since the first cohort of Chinese guest teachers arriving in the US in 2007, we have had nearly 1,200 guest teachers delivering Chinese coursework in over 300 districts and schools around the country. In the inaugural year of the AP Chinese Language and Culture course, we had 167 teachers teaching the course. Today, 800 teachers are teaching this course, not only in the US, but across the world. This is particularly significant because AP Chinese represents an advanced level of Chinese language and culture learning, often taken as the capstone language course in a high school experience. From a student perspective, participation in the AP exam has nearly quadrupled over the last decade. And I think all of us sitting here today would agree that we've made amazing progress. And we are just so proud of the work that students and teachers are doing to build towards an advanced level of proficiency in Chinese. As a researcher at the American Enterprise Institute recently put it, AP might be the single happiest education story of the century. Because through courses such as AP Chinese, we've been able to expand access without sacrificing rigor and quality. The College Board is committed to clearing a path to opportunity for students. However, it is abundantly clear to us that without the unwavering commitment and partnership of educators like yourselves, these remarkable achievements would simply not be possible. So on behalf of the College Board, and all the students whom you inspire every day and whom you've given the gift of multiculturalism and multilingualism, I wanna say thank you. And if you are a teacher, I'd like to ask you to stand. Now. <laughs> you. Thank you for your dedication and your hard work. And I would like to ask that those teachers who have uh, taught for 10 years or more to remain standing. Thank you. While we've made significant progress in the last 10 years, we know that there is much more work to do. In the coming years, we look forward to continuing to build bridges between the US and China through strong partnerships at the district level, at the school level, at the individual level that are based on mutual respect, understanding, and trust. We know that there are many more students in the US and around the world who are ready and qualified 
to take on the challenge of learning Chinese and taking that very important step in furthering multiculturalism and multilingualism, skills that will enable students to thrive both academically and professionally in the global world that we live today. So I, I look to all of you to continue to partner with us in clearing the path to opportunity for these students. I want to commend the great work that Zerjet Sheeran and her colleagues at Asia Society continue to do in international education and furthering global competency and thank them for their strong partnership. I also want to extend a special thank you to Madam Jingwei and our friends at Hanban Confucius Institute headquarters for traveling so far to be here with us today and the important work that they are doing not only in the US but all around the world. Thank you for your collaboration, support, and friendship. Lastly, but certainly not least, I want to thank Bob Davis and the rest of the College Board team, along with the team at Asia Society, who worked so tirelessly to plan this event and ensure that it is a meaningful and enjoyable experience for all of us. And in closing, I want to thank all of you for the and Please welcome the Global Chair of Asia Society and Chairman of Hung Lung Group Limited and Hung Lung Properties Limited, Ronnie Chan. 掌声有请亚洲协会全球联席主席,鸿隆集团董事长陈启宗先生. Good evening. When I uh, was asked to come, I was told by Jeff Wong of the Asia Society that this evening is going to be the most important meeting in the United States. On that basis, I accepted. <laughs> Little did I know that Xi Jinping, the president of China, and Donald Trump, the president of the United States, should decide to meet on the same day. <laughs> Obviously, what they're going to discuss this evening in Florida are very, very critical to US-China relations and indeed to the world. But I like to think that what they deal with is for the most part of a shorter term nature. If you were to look at a longer term, perhaps after all, Jeff Wong was right, that the most important meeting in this country today may still be this meeting because we're dealing with issues that are of the longer term. I was delighted to see so many teachers here, but let me tell you something. Many of you know me as a chairman of the Asia Society. Some of you know me as a real estate developer. Some of you know me as a high-tech investor. But let me tell you something, I am also a Mandarin Chinese teacher. 1993, uh, George H.W. Bush from this town uh, came to Hong Kong and went on my boat. I was amazed. He sat at the stern of the boat and read children's book to my then very, very young two boys. To reciprocate, I taught President George H.W. Bush Mandarin Chinese. Of course, I also taught Barbara Bush, but how good they are as students, you will hear soon. And so it gives me great pleasure to be able to read to you a letter from the 41st President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, to, a, to the attendees of the 2017 National Chinese Language Conference. Barbara and I join in welcoming all of you to our hometown of Houston, Texas, during your important conference on April 6 to 8, 2017 serving as one of the first envoys to the People's Republic of China in 1974, Barbara and I have a great appreciation of the critical importance of us sino relations. Upon our arrival in Beijing, we also very quickly gather an appreciation of the importance of speaking Mandarin. Unfortunately, neither Barbara nor I came close to mastering Mandarin, but we really enjoy the lessons. I assume that includes my lesson. Obviously, I'm not half as good as a teacher as you are because my student apparently confessed to his lack of Mandarin facility. I read on. Your mission of educating the next generation of global citizens as to the importance of speaking Mandarin in order to enhance our U.S. bilateral relations abroad is more important today than ever before. We congratulate all of you for your dedication to education and trust 
that beyond the conference, you will enjoy all that Houston has to offer to our many visitors. All the best, George H.W. Bush. I also read with honor and pleasure another letter dated today, April 6th, from the 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush. Greetings to those gathered in Houston, Texas for the 10th National Chinese Language Conference. Welcome to Texas. I know that learning a language, somebody else's language, is a kind gesture. It is a gesture of interest and it's a fundamental way to reach out to somebody and say, I care about you. So on January 5th, 2006, I was proud to launch the National Security Language Initiative with the hope of dramatically increasing the number of American learning, speaking, and teaching critical, cri critically needed foreign languages, including Chinese. I'm pleased that today so many young Americans have benefited from NSLI and are applying their new abilities to help increase national security, promote more effective communication, and enrich their own lives by learning to appreciate the many other cultures that make up the rich fabric of our nation. Laura and I are deeply gr grateful to the teachers who patiently and pa compassionately come alongside students to help them learn another language. Thank you for your devotion to giving young Americans new skills and therefore new opportunities. You are providing our youth the courage and drive to realize their dreams and helping to make America a better, more welcoming place. You have our best wishes for a memorable and meaningful conference. George W. Bush. Let me give you three reasons why I think learning Mandarin Chinese is so important. The first one is it enhances mutual understanding. 2,000 years ago, China was strong. That was during the Han Dynasty. The West was strong. That was during the Roman Empire. But unfortunately, that was perhaps the only time in history that the West and the East are both strong. Thereafter, the East, in mainly China, continued to thrive while the West had a decline. And then two, 300 years ago, China began to decline while the West rose as a result of Renaissance, rationalization, and even colonialism and so forth. Never has there been a time in human memory that the East and the West have to coexist as strong nations, as strong people. So today, for the first time, if you were to put it in a historic perspective, the first time in 2,000 years, perhaps, when the East and the West are both strong, and there's a need for mutual understanding. And the first place to start is obvious each other's language. To be sure, English is, is still the lingua franca of the world, but in order, if all we know is to stand on one end of the bridge, you will never serve adequately as the bridge. You must also know the other side, which, who speak Chinese. And so I'm delighted that so many in America these days are learning Mandarin Chinese, including many of those little young kids who are blonde-headed and whatever, it's wonderful to see them speaking Chinese. The second reason is for utilities. It's pra practical. I happen to serve on the board of a university, my alma mater, the University of Southern California. And about 10 years ago, we had a conference in Shanghai. And an African-American young man came to me and said, Mr. Chan, can I talk to you? He said, I fall in love with China. I'm going to make a career here. What should I do? I forgot his name, but I said, young man, the first thing you should do is to learn the language and to master the language. A year later, I was in a board meeting of USC in Los Angeles, and this young man showed up, and he wanted to talk to me, and he spoke to me in Mandarin Chinese. Imagine this young man moving back to Beijing or somewhere in China, an African-American kid. He stands out without saying a word, but once he opens his mouth and Mandarin Chinese comes out, he really stands out. This young man has a bright future. But it's not just for our career. As Dr. Tony Jackson, who is a vice president at the Asia Design in charge of our global education pro uh, programs, as Tony always tells the board, and I, thought, I know that it's the truth because many of you know it too, many young people, as 
you know, as we all do in Asia, at the Asia Society, we don't just go to the wealthy districts. We often, in fact, go to the opposite, where young people are considered, perhaps, by society as problematic. You manage to convince them, boys and girls, young men, young women, to learn Chinese. And once they learn, they master a little bit of Chinese. The confidence level of these young men and young women are amazing. It is a sight to behold. Their whole life is changed, not because they learn physics, although that is useful, not because they learn whatever, they are all useful in school, but it's because they have mastered Mandarin Chinese. So I want to thank all of you teachers for doing a great work that will change the life of so many young people in this country, not just the privileged, but also the less privileged. Finally, let me give you one last reason why you should learn Mandarin Chinese. I spend 70% of my time on the road. I go to many countries uh, whose languages are unbeknown to me. Seldom do I find a language as beautiful as Mandarin Chinese. I'm a Cantonese. I'm a Cantonese. I grew up speaking Cantonese. I don't speak Mandarin until I was 30, roughly. Cantonese is a very expressive language. For those of you who know that language, it's amazingly expressive. But it's not one of the most beautiful languages on earth. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, I'm so happy that in 1950-some, the, the, the people of China decided not to make Cantonese the national language. By the way, they came in number two. They miss it by one vote. And Mandarin Chinese won, and that become the official lang the uh, spoken language of China. And so all the students today have the privilege of learning a beautiful language. Why do I go, like to go home? Because I think my wife is beautiful, within and without. Whenever she opens her mouth, beautiful. Why do we want to learn English, um, Mandarin Chinese? Because it is beautiful. Speaking Chinese will make your life more beautiful and hopefully will make those around you also more beautiful. Thank you for attending this evening. Have a good time. Please welcome the Deputy Director General of Hanban and the Deputy Chief Executive of Confucius Institute Headquarters, Jing Wei. 掌声有请国家汉办副主任孔子学院总部副总干事敬伟女士。Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, it gives me great pleasure to read a letter from Madam Liu Yandong, Vice Premier of the State Council of the People's Republic of China, Chair of the Council of the Confucius Institute Headquarters. Uh, 孔子学院总部理事会主席刘延东女士给这次大会的贺信 It is in Chinese. The English translation will be available on the screen. 直此第十届全美中文大会开幕之际, 仅向大会的举办表示热烈的祝贺, 向各位代表致以诚挚的问候, 本次大会恰逢中国国家主席习近平访问美国，与特朗普总统举行重要会晤之际，两国元首会晤将就未来中美关系发展指明方向，开启新的篇章。六年前的2011年，我有幸出席在旧金山举行的第四届全美中文大会
，增进人文交流互鉴，对于推动两国全面合作、实现共赢、促进世界和平繁荣与人类幸福，有持久和深远的意义。全美中文大会不仅是分享语言教学经验、增进相互学习的重要平台。更是中美民间交往和人文交流的重要品牌。十年是承前启后、继往开来的里程碑。衷心祝愿全美中文大会越办越好，为深化中美人文交流、促进世界和平友谊做出更大的贡献。预祝会议取得圆满成功。刘延东。Um, now I would like to uh, add a few more words here. Uh, today I am very It's a great pleasure to be here among so many friends, old and new, at this year's NCLC. Uh, given the uh, limited time, I meant to speak in both languages, uh, but probably given the limited time, I have to give it up a little bit, as uh, so I was speaking um, English, probably, for the sake of um, some of the audience. Um, for the past nine years, um, there was another Chinese lady um, who spoke every year on this stage of NCLC, um, who is much more charming and intelligent and humorous than I am. Well, uh, I spent four years uh, learning English when I did college. And when I was asked what is the most difficult part of learning a second language, and I told them, the most difficult part is to make the audience laugh. I've given it up long ago. But this lady I'm talking about, she's so talented. She's talented in that, and she's not majored in, in uh, English. But when she spoke, it seems that the whole um, audience are uh, so um, welcoming her to um, continue to speak. And I think that um, most of you know whom I'm talking about. Um, yes, it's Madame Shiling, who is no longer the leader of Hanban due to her age. And she is among those whom I want to extend my heartfelt gratitude and pay tribute to. And thanks to their efforts, NCLC is getting more and more popular and successful. Although as time goes by, there are the change of leadership or participants. Yet the friendship that has been built during the past decade between Hanban, Asia Society, and College Board will, no, will not change. The strengthening collaborations we have with so many school districts, schools, and universities in the states will not change. The encouraging prospects we share with each and every one of you will not change. On the first NCLC uh, in 2008, it was projected that by the year of 2015, the number of those learning Mandarin in education institutions in the United States would reach 120,000, and over 1,200 drops of local Chinese language teachers would be added. Last year, there were nearly 400,000 Chinese language learners and over 1,500 teachers in American education institutions much more than the estimate. Meanwhile, the number of Chinese students studying in the States exceeds 32,000, and the number of American students studying in China is around 23,000. Um, I'm sorry, it's not 32,000, uh, it's uh, 320,000. Um, that's the number of the Chinese students studying in the um, States. Um, so last year, Governor of Utah and Delaware stated that they are proud to be investing U.S.-China ties by advancing language immersion programs 
and promoting Mandarin language learning for the students. They urge all policymakers to join them in making foreign language learning and Mandarin language learning in particular a priority for American young people. I believe that one of the reasons that we gather today is because we share similar visions as they do. When we look into future, I want to share with you the following three aspects. First, I think that we can better learn together. Two countries have strengths and weaknesses of her own. We shall learn more from each other and learn together so that we will be able to provide more opportunities for teachers and students to share more best practices to improve pedagogy and performance. And during the past 10 years, in collaboration with our American partners, Hanban invited 6,000 American educators to visit and meet their counterparts in China through Chinese Bridge um, Chinese Trip program. And one of the participants of that program, Mr. Roger Harris, who is from a Boston Public School, once said, when he participated, oh, you're here, oh, great. And you said that uh, when you participated in the 2013 Chinese Bridge Program, that you want to establish partnership with Chinese schools and learn from each other, as well as share your educational ideas. Well, the same amount of Chinese teachers, about 6,000, were invited to help teach Mandarin in American schools and universities. And when they return to China, they take, take back home American culture and friendship. And second, I think that we can better grow together. Many common challenges urge us to work hand in hand, such as to reduce digital divide, to guarantee safe campus, to provide disadvantaged groups with more access to quality education. And we see there is a long way to go. And we also see there is tremendous potential. China and the US can better grow together and make the countries greater by strengthening partnerships, building trust among our young people and preparing them to be future leaders. And third, I think we can better live together. We see many differences across countries, but there lies the beauty of being different and diverse. You may find so many phrases and proverbs in Chinese language talking about inclusiveness, tolerance, reciprocity, or mutual benefit. What matters is how we try to respect each other, how to understand it from the other's perspective. My personal experience tells me to speak the language definitely helps. Um, 所以我想在这里跟大家分享一下，在过去我们的呃十年当中，我们可以看到，在呃我们汉办与我们非常紧密的合作伙伴大学理事会亚洲协会的共同努力下，我们在美国的很多的呃这个学生的数量和教师的数
呃，小学这个沉浸式的小学，我也见到了学生的家长，我也感觉到他们现在也开始有这样的这种热情，就像中国的家长想让他们的孩子学习英文一样，现在在希望他们的孩子能够更多的学习到中文。所以我想呢，在未来的这些岁月当中，呃，我们呃可以共同努力，来一起学习，一起成长，啊、呃，一起能够让这个世界变得更好。Um, 最后呢 ，I wanted to thank College Board and Asia Society for all your friendship and trust, and also I wanted to thank each and every one of you present today again. 再次感谢我们大学理事会和啊亚洲协会的各位合作的伙伴，呃，感谢我们在座的每一位，也非常感谢刚才给我们朗诵诗歌和唱儿歌的小朋友们。I believe that、uh, when we work together, that definitely will be a much better、um, future for us to look into. 谢谢 ，Thank you very much. Please welcome the president of Rice University, David LeBron. 掌声有请莱斯大学校长 David LeBron 先生。Good evening. Really? Let me do that again. Good evening. You can, you can respond in Chinese. That's good too. I'll, I'll get to it in a moment, but I'll explain to you why I won't understand. Now, I want to begin also by thanking the Asia Society and the College Board for their vision and support in putting together and sponsoring such an important conference and an opportunity for all of you to to come together in this important way. I especially wanted to say that because, as the father. Of a 17-year-old daughter who is preparing for the SATs, that is probably the only nice thing I'm going to say about the College Board this year. <laughs> Now, who would have thought, when I first visited China in 1980, that I would have the opportunity to come to a gathering of this size of Chinese teachers? Primarily in the United States. When I visited China in 1980 with a friend, I was kind of a curiosity. All we had to do was walk along the Bund in Shanghai, and people would gather around. And we were among the first group of Americans to go to China as tourists. That seems to me an extraordinary thing over that period. Of now, I hate to say it, 37 years. Now, I was kind of astounded when I received the invitation to speak this evening, because I'm an odd choice to speak on either on the subject of learning Chinese or even on the subject of global education, because I'm against both. Nervous laughter. So let me explain. So my wife comes from China. She speaks native Chinese. I speak almost none. I have no idea what my tie says, but I trust my wife that she wouldn't let me wear it if it was too embarrassing. Now, I tell people. That I have discovered the secret to getting along with your in-laws, and that's namely, not to be able to speak their language. <laughs> the only problem is that doesn't explain why my parents made it quite clear that they preferred my wife to me. And then there's my daughter. Until last year, I was wildly enthusiastic about studying abroad. After all, I had done it, and then my daughter decided that she wanted to spend her junior year of high school in China, and I, of course, was against that. But then she had the killer argument, which was, "Dad, you did it. 
course, I did in Germany and not China. So on a very personal level, I think learning Chinese and studying abroad are just terrible ideas. Now, more seriously, my experience in Germany was life-changing. And it was life-changing in part both because I had studied German for four and a half years before going, and because, because of that, by the time I left Germany, I spoke nearly fluent German. There are, to this day, expressions and concepts that I cannot express in English. And I learned to understand another people, another culture, another country, in ways I could never have without that experience. Nonetheless, I was surprised to be asked to give a, what was I told was the keynote address. But then it was explained to me that the idea of a keynote address came from the architectural concept of a keystone. And the keystone is that actually small stone that sits at the top and withstands all the pressure put on by the other stones. And so here I am, the last thing standing between you and dinner. <laughs> that was the concept of the keynote address, that I was under this pressure, and every minute too long that I spoke, the pressure would increase. So getting beyond the hurdle of what an inappropriate choice I was for the speaker this evening, there was then the question of what I might say. And of course, what occurred to me were the obvious things to say, things that you already knew. I could talk about how essential language learning is for cultural understanding. I could talk about how great it is that China is now among the top five destinations for Americans studying abroad. I could talk about how wonderful it is, as you've already heard, that the number of Chinese studying in the United States has increased five-fold over the last decade. Or I could talk about the importance of still trying to achieve the 100,000 and 1 million strong initiatives. But you know all of these things, and you know them much better than I do. I could talk about my over 30 trips to China since that very first trip I took in 1980, and the astonishing change that we have witnessed in China and how much I have learned, not only about what is going on in China, but learned things that I could bring back to the United States and to my responsibilities at Rice University. And of course, I could talk about my favorite subject, which is Rice University and the extraordinary education we offer in Chinese education and Chinese culture and the relationships that we have built with universities across China in both education and research and the increase in Chinese students studying at the United States so that when a student sits down for lunch or dinner, there's a good chance that one of the students at his or her table will be from China. But as you've already heard, as I began to think about it, as you heard already earlier this evening, as we sit down to dinner, two presidents, what my daughter would refer to as two real presidents, Donald Trump and Xi Jinping, they're sitting down to dinner in Florida, I assume right about now. The food, I'm sure you're, this is going to be an excellent dinner, but I would bet theirs is just a tad better. But what might, what might we, all of you, if you had the chance, if you were standing in front of them giving this intensely pressured, end it as soon as you can keynote address, what might you want to say to them? And perhaps more important, what might you want them to say to each other? The value of cultural exchange and understanding was reflected in some way in President Trump's choice of ambassador to China, Kerry Branstad, who met Xi Jinping when 
President Xi visited as part of a delegation. Of course, then he was just a, a, a county party official at the time. Over 30 years ago when he came and visited Iowa, and that experience was important enough to him, like my experience in Germany, that when he came back for the first time as president, he wanted to go back to Iowa, just as I wanted to go back to the relatively small town that I stayed in in Germany. So what might we want to tell them? Well, surely we might want to tell them about the vital importance of building cultural understanding and personal connections among our young people, as was so evident in that story. And we might want to tell them about the importance of making it easy, or at least reasonably easy, to travel between our countries, of not subjecting visitors to requirements out of proportion to the dangers that they actually present. We might want to tell them that trade and investment help tie people together not drive them apart. And we might want to tell them about the critical role educational exchange programs in building deeper levels of understanding. And we might want to tell them that they need to continue to build bridges, not walls. And we might want to tell them that universities are, of course, I think, the keystone for building these intercultural relationships. And we might want to tell them that the great problems of the world in health and energy, in food and water, will be solved because of our ability to collaborate with people with different perspectives and backgrounds. And we might want to say to them that we hope they will say to each other that whatever our disagreements may be, that we or they will never interfere with these bridges that we must continue to build. All these things we might want to tell them, and our hope is that they would listen. So tonight, let us proceed in optimism and hope so, for in many ways, the future of our world does depend on it. And we depend on you, the teachers of foreign language and culture, in this case, of course, Chinese language and culture, one of the most important cultures in our world and almost certainly the most important bilateral relationship over the next decades. And we depend on you, especially with our young people, but not only with our young people, but also those also out in the working world, people unlike myself who have the capacity to learn a third language. Without you and so many others, what hope do we have of laying the foundations that we need, not only of teaching our young people a language, but inspiring them toward learning and engagement with a distant and far off and perhaps strange culture Language is the window through which one achieves a deep understanding of a culture. And so let me conclude, and I hope this doesn't get culturally lost because of age, if nothing else, by paraphrasing one of my favorite movie quotations. This from the movie The Blues Brothers. You are on a mission from God, and we're counting on you. Thank you for all you do in educating our children and others and building a safer future. Shesheh.